Hello and welcome to The Point. I'm Marcel Weider. Education has become a topic of conversation over the last couple of months with the contracts expiring from education workers and staff and the possibility of uh, strikes in the education sector have uh, become more and more a possibility. Uh, I have today with me our guest is Sally Meseret, who's the president of the Ontario Student Trustees Association, Harvey Bischoff, the president of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation, and Jennifer Arp, a former vice chair of the Toronto District School Board and a former trustee as well. So before we get into it, let me show you a little commercial that the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation has run over the back to school period in September. Today's students will return to classrooms with fewer teachers and support staff, providing fewer course options, and fewer extracurricular activities, which will lead to lower graduation rates, damaging Ontario's economy, So Harvey, let me begin with you. Your members are obviously concerned that your, your contract expired on August 31st. Where are you in the negotiations with the province at this point? So we've had a total of five days of substantive bargaining between the two groups that I represent at central bargaining tables. So my support staff members and uh, the English public high school teachers that OSSTF represents. Um, at Throughout that five days, uh, let's say by the end of it, we had gotten back not a single substantive proposal from the government and uh, school board employers who are represented at that table. Um, and we have decided most recently, a couple of days ago, that we would move to uh, taking strike votes to the membership, central table strike votes. Um, as a signal that uh, it's really time to get moving. Six weeks into the school year, students going without um, access to s some of the resources uh, that they had just last year because of government cuts. Um, and it's really time to, uh, to try to find a way back to, uh, to uh, providing the kind of resources that we used to be able to. Now the government and the school boards obviously knew that the contracts were expiring on August 31st. So it was no secret of that date. Why, what happened? Why didn't they negotiate much earlier and only now? Yeah, it's, I, I wish I could answer that question, but I can tell you what they did instead. Um, given the opportunity under the, under the School Board's Collective Bargaining Act, the, the statutory regime that covers our bargaining, they could have opened up the notice to bargain period on March the 4th. They waited mm -hmm. until April the 29th. We served notice immediately on April the 29th. They could have met with us the next day or the day after. They chose to wait until the very last of the 15 days allowable under the statute before they finally sat down with us um, for a grand total of two hours. Um, central table bargaining is a bit of a cumbersome process, um, but it became clear that we wouldn't be able to agree what should be bargained there, and we recommended an expedited alternative dispute resolution mechanism so that we could resolve what would be negotiated at the central table and get going quickly in June or July, let's say. They insisted that we instead follow this uh, uh, drawn out labor board process. So we had a labor board hearing in July and didn't get a decision on what would be bargained centrally until September. Mm -hmm. um, even then when we set dates, then um, once we had the labor board decision, um, there's a 15 day period again where they are required to meet with us uh, in the first day of negotiations. They unilaterally canceled the only date that fell within that. So while we have a Minister of Education running around publicly crowing about how he wants to get deals done quickly, um, in this and in virtually everything else I've seen, their actions and their stated intentions are in contradiction. So really, we had a five month window where you could have actually got a deal done and the government frittered it away with delaying tactics until we get to this point now. Absolutely, and, and in, at the same time what they did was with unilateral announcements uh, with the previous minister on March the 15th, um, they began the move towards the elimination of 10,000 teaching positions. Uh, that'll be a four-year process. They cut hundreds and hundreds of support staff out of the system because they eliminated the funding that previously uh, allowed boards to hire that support those support staff who 
provide assistance to our highest needs, special needs, at-risk students. They cut that out unilaterally and we began the school year without those supports and they're now leveraging students' educational experience against the bargaining table in a way that I think is completely unconscionable. When they talk about um, putting students first, they've, again, you know, their intentions and their actions are in contradiction um, and, uh, and we have been doing our best to put students first throughout this process. Well, speaking of students, that's a great segue to you, Sally. What are you hearing and what are you seeing in the schools happening right now? Right, so as of right now, there is a significant um, recognition um, up from students of the impacts this will have on their education, right? We, just the, just the previous weeks, we were seeing that students were really concerned that classes were going to be canceled. Um, and so now, you know, gearing up, especially within, within high school, students again concerned um, that they might not be able to access education. That is, being in school is central to a student's experience, to a student's well-being. Um, students must be at the forefront of all decisions made coming from whichever parties. And, and, and the, the, the fundamental thing that we have to keep in mind is it's not just short term, it's long term. It's the implications this will have um, on students' futures. If students don't have access to courses, they can't apply to post-secondary. It has, is, has much greater implications than we can see um, just on the surface. So it's important that we consider not just the immediate, but the after effects of what happens. And I think it's a concern that many students share because it's their futures that are being um, that are being kind of considered. So it's, it's important that that is taken into consideration with any decisions made. And are you hearing back from students in the various uh, school boards across the province mm -hmm. of increased class sizes, of courses being canceled, of uh, programs being curtailed? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I get stories all the day, um, they're all, all the time. Um, there was one girl that mentioned to me she had, there were so many kids in her class at one point she couldn't even sit. She had to stand because there were so many students in her classes. And that's just one example. That's one anecdote um, that I've heard. But, but the reality is that th that happens a lot. That, that is not, a, it, it's a one story, but it represents the experiences of many students. And it represents both the experiences and the fears that many students possess. Um, on what can happen and what will what that what that picture looks like and what that will now do to their future and what that will now do to their opportunities that they have. It's not just about being in class; it's about how being or not being in class can in impact um, your future and the courses you can take and the universities you can apply to. And and then that that impacts our province, right? Like that mm -hmm. that that has everything is interrelated and correlated. And I think it's important that we remember that. Well, that's a good point because Harvey, your organization. Uh, sponsored a study by the Conference Board of Canada that looked into the impact of education on the Ontario economy. Can you give us a little bit of highlights of some of that uh, report? Absolutely, and we went to the Conference Board not because they're you know noted uh, left-wing union supporters, but because they are well established and have a high, deal, a high degree of credibility. Um, and and therefore we knew that their you know their study would be would be worth something. What they told us was for every dollar invested in the education system, a dollar thirty is returned to the broader economy. First of all, and the contrary is true. For every dollar that's taken out of the education system, the broader economy loses a dollar thirty. And you know that's sort of the situation we're looking at we're looking at right now. But additionally, when you invest in education and through those investments raise graduation rates. Uh, those increased graduation rates, rates lead to lower costs that are borne by the public purse. Things like health care, um, things like the costs of uh, running the judicial system, things like social welfare payments. Um, so you can treat um, uh, education as just a cost and see it in the short term. Um, but when you do, you lose sight of the fact that, in fact, education is an investment that improves the economy for all Ontarians, but also reduces the draw on the public purse. And, uh, and so education... So taxpayers save money. Taxpayers save money. Um, more people are, are um, you know, gainfully employed in the broader economy. Um, and, and, you know, when you save costs in things like the judicial system, it's not just a cost saving. That means there are there are other social goods like fewer victims of crime. Mm -hmm. These are these are you know positives that arise out of that kind of investment. Mm -hmm. Now, Jennifer, you're a former trustee, and in terms of how are school boards reacting to these uh, proposed cuts from the government? Well, I think across the province we've seen a, a varied response from local boards about the response. You know, the large boards 
have certainly been vocal in their opposition to the point that we've seen directors of education come out speaking against the cuts, which is something we've never, ever seen before for a bureaucrat to take a political position like this, I think speaks to the concerns that we are all sharing about, you know, the impact that taking 10,000 educators out of the system is going to do long term for ed public education in the province. Mm -hmm. Now, Jennifer referenced the 10,000, and Harvey, you mentioned it earlier. Where did that uh, number come from? So uh, that March 15th announcement that I referenced earlier, the Minister of Education declared their, the intention to move from a funded average class size of 22 to 1 to a funded average class size of 28 to 1. So right now, every time 22 kids walk through a school door, um, the board gets funding to hire one teacher. They want to move to the point where it takes 28 students to generate the funding for one teacher. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about is a loss of one out of four teaching positions in the province, um, which means one out of four classes that they teach as well. So when Sally talks about, about uh, access to courses, a quarter of the high school courses offered last year will be eliminated four years from now if we continue to go down this road. That means for students to get access to, well, even the courses they need to graduate uh, will become much more difficult, uh, but certainly access to courses that are by their very nature smaller because they have safety concerns or equipment uh, issues like technology courses, mm -hmm. um, those things will become much more difficult to offer. Um, and, and what you will have uh, essentially is a a core of mandatory courses that are overcrowded and more difficult in you know which to provide the kind of professional attention to students that you want to have for them to thrive. Mm -hmm. And Sally, when we talk about what Harvey's saying, taking one out of every four teaching positions out of the system, what does that do to the school? What does uh, it do, do to in terms of how students are able to interact with their teachers, how they're mm -hmm. able to interact on uh, programs. And uh, I assume I'm, I'm a parent of uh, two high school boys, uh, the extracurricular activities that uh, a lot of the teachers are involved with. Oh, absolutely. It has far reaching impacts um, that, that are very, that, that are even hard to fully conceptualize, right? On, on one hand, you have the, the arts course and the humanity cor humanities courses that round out a student's educational experience. You can see those being, you know, frittered away. You can also see the main main courses, like a science, like a biology or a physics, probably isn't going to get cut, mm -hmm. but it's going to be, there's going to be more students there, therefore reducing the educational kind of experience that you gain from that. Um, in terms of being able to connect with your teacher, it's going to be difficult. And then this has huge implications for low-income students, for students that already don't have access. Those are the students that are going to suffer even more than they already are, right? And, and the notion that it's, it's, it's equal across the province, well, you know, there are some students that are going to be hit even harder than that. It's the students that are already suffering. And I think that's something that maybe isn't considered that often, but it is, it is a fundamental um, issue that needs to be addressed. And of course, extracurriculars are going to be huge. If a teacher is, you know, uh, if, this, if a school is understaffed and they, they can barely manage um, handling the school course load, it's very difficult to provide extracurricular opportunities which enrich a student's experience and give them leadership opportunities they need to be effective um, when they enter the workforce. Now one of the proposals by the government is to have more e-learning programs. Right. They're now going to mandate uh, four program, four classes right. over the course of four years will be uh, in e-learning uh, format. How is that going to impact students? What are, what are your thoughts and those of your members? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So um, I, I will note that our, our association released a report um, gathering over 6,000 student responses across the province, um, outlining the concerns they have along with a series of recommendations. Um, but ultimately, something like e-learning and, and mandating it so quickly, um, there are huge implications for this. This is like fundamentally changing the, the structure of education because now you have students in high school that are, ma it's mandatory for them to take those courses, which means preparation for that has to start in grade seven and eight and grade six. Students need to be taught. This is fundamentally changing the structure of how education works. Um, and, and just the, the, the right away, like the, the immediate implications of that. Students in grade nine who may not have the time management, who may not have the resources to be able to, to ef effectively um, support themselves within e-learning are going to be really impacted by this. Students that don't have time management, low-income students that may not have access to a computer or rely 
type of Wi-Fi. There are huge implications for this. Um, and then, of course, it's it's ulti it, it ultimately comes down to, you know, reducing costs. And something like e-learning to be um, kind mm -hmm. of effectively um, implemented requires an investment as well. And um, it, it's important to consider that if something has to be implemented and integrated fully, it has to be integrated with the supports in place. Um, and if something like that has to go through, there has to be adequate supports to ensure that students can actually thrive in that kind of an environment. Well, you represent members right across the province, yeah. and so in, in some rural and northern communities, they don't have high-speed internet access. Uh, kids from lower incomes may not have access to a computer. How is that going to impact the educational experience? It has huge, if, if you don't, if a computer is your central point, of access to education and you don't have a properly functioning computer or you don't have internet, you cannot access your education. And that is, a, like I could go on, that is a huge <laughs> problem um, for students. Um, and and we, we have to understand that, yes, yeah, students in like high income areas, this is fine, but it's going to hurt the people that are already hurting. It's going to hurt those, um, you know, those northern school boards. And I, what I will note too is that E-learning in and of itself is not a problem. E-learning is a phenomenal educational tool, um, and, and it, it really does um, enrich a student's experience. It's just kind of difficult when it's mandated across the province so broadly. E-learning is uh, it's phenomenal, but it's, it's very difficult for everyone to be able to have that within their education and to have that have be adequately supported um, as a graduation requirement. You know, if you don't have those courses, you do not graduate. And I, mm -hmm. I think it's important to note that. And so it's important that we recognize that if we don't support students, they don't graduate. So mm -hmm. that's what it comes down to. Uh, Harvey, how do your members uh, react to what Sally is saying in terms of the e-learning issue? So uh, I have members who every day do a great job delivering e-learning to students. Um, and there are circumstances in which it's, it's um, an excellent uh, program. The fact is, though, right now, 5% of students voluntarily choose to take one or more e-learning courses. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about scaling that up by 20 times, where 100% of students are required to take four credits. Sally's described all kinds of the pitfalls um, that exist around access and, and uh, differential access for kids from different ends of the socioeconomic spectrum or depending on, on geography. Um, that That's, of course, an, an issue um, on its own. Um, but we just we don't have the research the background empirical understanding to know that a program like this is going to be successful so we're saying um and you know my members through the positions that we are putting forward at the bargaining table are saying let's just step back for let's study this let's look at what the pitfalls are let's look at what the opportunities are how can this be done well uh, what are the supports that are required? What's the infrastructure that's required? Um, and before we go ahead and make Ontario students guinea pigs in an experiment that hasn't been tried in any other jurisdiction that we can find, um, we need to we need to do some analysis and see if, if you know what gives this a chance of success. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer, you represented a very diverse uh, area of Toronto uh, that had lower income mm -hmm. families as well as high income families. How would you see uh, an e-learning program work in your community, for well, example? I think, I think the challenge is just from the community that I represented in my time as trustee, when I think about something like e-learning and the challenges, you know, the communities that have access will have access. Those kids are going to be fine, you know? You, whether it's larger class sizes or e-learning, you know, their parents can afford tutors. They're going to be okay. It's the kids in the pockets of low-income neighborhoods and families that are living at or below the poverty line and in precarious situations where it's single parent that that these changes are are really going to mean the difference between graduating and not and that ultimately hurts our province you know if we're not bringing the next generation and everyone in the next generation not just those who can afford to achieve right the the toronto district school board and in the time that i was there and continues to really put an emphasis on equity and ensuring that we're reaching the students who haven't traditionally been reached. So whether it's black, you know, black students or, you know, low income families, you know, the initiatives are all in place and what the government has done is thrown a wrench into all of all of these plans and strategic planning that's gone on. And, you know, how a board like TDSB adapts to that, I don't know. You know, I'm 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 quite honestly disappointed in the trustees association, especially around e learning, that they haven't taken a stronger position. This is supposed to roll out in a year. Next September, 
kids are supposed to start completing one credit a year online. And we haven't heard a strong position from OPSPA. It is not the right direction. The, the ch you know, the 5% of students who are choosing e-learning are choosing them for various reasons, whether it's because they require flexible timetabling, because they live in the north and want access to an elected that they can't get in their local board. There's a whole number of reasons. Forcing kids to do it affects their social, emotional well-being. It stresses them out. Kids are already, you know, stressed out at a level that we've never seen before. And we're just piling on, piling on, piling on. And with, with the trustees not coming forward and taking a strong position, you know, I don't think they're adequately representing the people that have elected them to sit in the room and make the decisions for public education in the province. So what could parents do to affect any uh, change in the government's position? Well, I think, you know, through school council is a really great way for parents to get involved. Uh, conversations can happen around those tables. Um, there's tons of grassroots parent groups popping up all over the place in every geographical region of Toronto and lots of other places in the province. They're all active on social media, so it's easy for parents to go online and search them. Ontario Families for Public Education is a great place to start. Um, sharing infographics, talking to their friends who maybe don't have you know, a vested interest or a stake in public education, uh, informing them about what's going on because I think, you know, in order to make this change, it's going to take, you know, a real mass of people. We started to see it uh, last week, October 10th, with the walk-in for education. My elementary school has never done any sort of activism, no protesting, no nothing. And, you know, one of the most, you know, conservative women in the school was the one leading the chants in the mm -hmm. front of the schoolyard at the start of the day. So I think what we're seeing is is the mobilizing and, and the more we can do, the more we can reach out to those MPPs who are in ridings that swing and, you know, put the pressure on, um, you know, maybe we'll see a positive outcome at the end. Mm -hmm. Now e-learning and, and I think Sally and you both referenced uh, that it's going to put more stress on students. And one of the concerns that is out there is, is that students are under so much stress and mental health has become more and more of, a, of an issue that's being recognized. How do you see the e-learning, the reduction in the number of teaching positions, what impact is that going to have on mental health? Sally? Yeah, absolutely. It will have, it will have um, consequences and, and, and mental health is something that it's oftentimes referenced as an additive to our education system like we'll, we'll learn our courses and we'll talk about mental health but it actually has to be integrated and streamlined into the process of um, of, of everyday education it has to be a, a fundamentally part of the system and with something like e-learning you know this t students don't have access to, to, to supports no one's going to be there and ask mm -hmm. you how you're doing it it's difficult to gain that kind of um, connection with teachers um, and as well in terms of um, changing class sizes and when students have ultimately comes down to this if students have less supports students will be less mentally well students need in fact students need more support students need more guidance counselors students need more people encouraging them showing them mm -hmm. pathways and when that is reduced well you know students won't be if the students don't have support students will not thrive it's, it's very simple it's not a complicated formula mm -hmm. this one it's it's very much about how you how you support teachers is how you support students um, and well-being needs to be integrated um, within the daily processes of an education system. And Harvey, your members are on the front line in this area. What are they seeing? Are they, you know, there was a recent report that said the number of violent incidences in schools have gone up dramatically and uh, some are linking that to a lack of mental health supports, a lack of uh, supports as Sally's pointed out. How are your members dealing with that? Yeah, so bear in mind that my members are both uh, those English public high school mm -hmm. teachers, but also support staff in a lot mm -hmm. of boards around the province. So uh, my teacher members are witness to the, uh, the uh, increasing uh, mental health issues among students that have been, you know, have been well documented. Um, they have been subject to uh, the increases in violence that are occurring in our schools. Um, but they're not mental health experts. Some of my support staff members, that's in yeah, fact their very role. They're there to support students' needs uh, in that fashion. And while the stresses and strains in the school system are increasing and students are, are subject to, to uh, an increasing number of mental health difficulties, 
my support staff members who should be addressing those very issues are being cut, you know. So I, I give you an example of one board in the province where fully half of the professional student services personnel, um, child and youth workers, behavior experts, people who, who supported kids at risk and helped them move their way through to, to success and graduation, they were, they were eliminated. Um, so exactly the opposite of what is required is happening. Mm -hmm. So I want to pose to both you and Sally, and, and I guess also to Jennifer, why should people who don't have kids in the education system be at all concerned about this? Like if, if, I, if I'm a taxpayer, I don't have kids, uh, why should I really care about what's happening in the school system? So it goes back, at least in part, um, to to what I was making reference to earlier with regard to the conference board report. So, um, when when there is uh, a withdrawal of, of investment in education, there is a, a subsequent loss and a magnified loss in the broader economy. So anybody who works in Ontario, anybody who wants a job, uh, anybody who employs uh, Ontario's high quality graduates should be concerned. Over the last 16 years, we've raised graduation rates by 20%. One in five more students compared to 16 years ago is in a position to take on post-secondary education, is in a position to move into an apprenticeship in a skilled trade, skilled trade, which is a crying need in this province. We suffer a severe shortage of uh, skilled tradespeople. So if I'm you know, working in the economy and can't get access to those high quality graduates, um, whatever kind of work I'm doing is going to suffer. Mm -hmm. So so this is not a concern that should be limited to, to students or to parents. It affects all of Ontario. Mm -hmm. Sally, would you like to? Absolutely. The one thing I noticed is that education is not the be all end all. Education is a means by which we bring people and we bring our province to become more innovative, innovative to become um, greater in their economic assets in what they can accomplish. And education is not, it's, it's not secluded. Education is the means by which we improve ourselves. Just this past summer, I was in Singapore and, and they have a phenomenal education mm -hmm. system. The focal point of their economy comes from their education system. If you look at any country in the world that has good education, their economy is also doing better. And, 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 and the notion that, oh, you know, I don't have kids in the system, so it doesn't matter to me. If you don't pay for a student's education, you're going to be paying for their, their health care. You're going to be paying for when they're, you know, when, when, when the, if, if, you know, if it comes to the point where th maybe they need, it, it comes to, maybe they're, they become in trouble with the law, right? Like, the notion that um, if we don't, I don't want to pay for their education, you're going to be paying regardless. Are, anyone who suffers is a burden upon our society as a whole. Any any one person that is not able to achieve, um, we still pay the price as a society. Your taxes are still going to have to go to subsidize another issue that they have. And so, education is a is a proactive measure we can take instead of being reactive and you know struggling to make up for the flaws in the education system. If we actually invest in it at the at the beginning, then we'll see greater implications further down the line. It's an investment, not an expense. So Jennifer, I'm sure this question has come up in, when you go out knocking on doors uh, and you run into a house that doesn't have kids and they pose that same question. How do you respond? It's a, it's a bigger piece of a puzzle. You know, when the province chose to invest in K-12, what we saw was, you know, not just higher quality education in that panel, but then we saw that our post-secondary institutions made massive gains globally. Then that, you know, allowed us to start attracting the types of businesses and opportunities to our province. If we're going to take money out of public education, then all of a sudden, you know, do, do universities have to go to international students in order to find, you know, the, the, the students who are up to the level that, that, the, that the university is teaching at? Maybe. Do those students then leave our province at the end of their to go back to their home country? The, the domino effect and, and what will happen as a result of not investing in K-12 and the long-term impact. You know, we're talking about four years of, of cuts, but four years that could take 20 or 30 to make up. We're losing an entire generation. We're changing and rewiring an entire generation for I can't figure out exactly why, because the, on a whim, the government said that this is what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Harvey, you raised a, an interesting point in, in your response about graduation rates. And uh, 
I think some people are trying to make the argument, yes, people are graduating, but they're being pushed through the system, and that in the testing, we've actually seen a decline, that, uh, that, that student testing results have actually shown a decline, and that we're not really getting the quality education that we thought we're getting. How do you respond to that? So there's one measure in which we've seen a decline, and that's grade six EQAO math testing. Um, and that may point to um, uh, concern around the curriculum um, that should be addressed with a, you know, a thoughtful, measured approach. Um, although there are other measures that make you wonder uh, whether or not it's, you know, things are really uh, as concerning as they might appear from, from the EQAO testing. Um, by virtually every other measure, um, including international testing, including the way we stack up against the best education systems around the world, Ontario is a standout jurisdiction for education. We, um, we graduate students in higher numbers. Um, we send kids off to post-secondary in higher numbers. And along with that, we've, over the last 16 years, closed the achievement gap between kids at, at opposite ends of the economic spectrum, uh, social economic spectrum, between new Canadians and those whose families have been here for mm -hmm. generations. So we've lifted up uh, a group of kids who, who um, would not have had that opportunity otherwise. And think of the contribution that they can make then, um, going to post-secondary, going into skilled trades. Um, and so, so you know, uh, by by the if you aggregate the measures uh, of our school system and compare them to anywhere else in the world we stack up impressively mm -hmm. and sally have you heard from your uh, members uh on the issue of the eqao how they feel and if uh you're seeing those uh numbers improve or decrease what are you hearing absolutely and and so with EQAO with it being a standardized test obviously within that students raise concerns about um, standardized testing period as a whole um, however EQAO um, as it is broad and as it is you know tested across the province it is it is a good indicator um, of the state of education it is a very good means by which we we can recognize what areas are you know increasing what care where areas are decreasing and where supports um, kind of need to be effectively directed to ensure that we support students and obviously over the past we've seen we've seen for the most part we've seen a positive positive kind of trend and so r r as of right now we're even working with EQAO and seeing how that can be enhanced how something like a standardized test can be enhanced to ensure that it, act it is actually representative mm -hmm. of the students that it is actually testing a lot of times standardized tests leave out um, populations of people um, and so if we if we actually want to stand if you want to test people you have to make sure that it's it's relevant and you know if you change up the content you may see that students do better just because it's more related to their personal experiences so on the topic of standardized testing it certainly needs to be more representative and it is a good um, it is a good indicator of the state of the, of, of the state of education not necessarily the be all end all but one benchmark we can use to mm -hmm. assess how students from across the province and across the education sector are actually doing mm -hmm. Harvey I'd like to get into a little bit more specifics on what's happening with negotiations and and where you see things are. First of all, you've done something very unusual in terms of bargaining. You've put online all your proposals for the public to see. And uh, we can put up the, the URL. It's bargainingforeducation.ca. And you can go there and, and download and see all the documents uh, there. Why did you do that? Um. I think it goes back to something I was saying earlier. We have a government that's claiming one thing while doing the opposite. And we want to um, take a process that often happens in back rooms and, and you know, uh, happens sort of in the dark, drag it out into the sunlight and let everybody have a look at um, who's putting forward proposals that actually put students first. Um, and we contend that uh, our proposals for maintaining staffing in schools, uh, our proposal to, to study um, that e-learning uh, idea before it goes ahead, uh, that these are the sorts of things that uh, people support and um, the reaction tells me that in fact they do and they don't see the government's direction of, of eliminating uh, 
support staff, eliminating teachers, throwing kids into this experiment of, of e-learning as a positive way uh, forward. So we're going to conduct this out in the light of day. Um, we're, we're happy to do so. In fact, we're proud to do so because we're proud of the proposals that we're putting forward that are, are good for students, they're good for, our, uh, for the education system, they're good for Ontario's future economy as, as we've you know, discussed already. Um, and and we're, we're very happy to have people scrutinize those proposals not just our initial proposals that we put on the table, but we will update them after each, uh, after, um, after we bargain um, and uh, along the way through the bargaining mm -hmm. process, regular updates, so that people can see that we are, we are sticking to those things that are going to support student achievement and, and success in the future. So what are the key points that you're raising in bargaining at this stage? Yeah, I, uh, alluded to them already, but, but fundamentally it's around maintaining um, the, the teaching position so we can maintain the course offerings, maintain the class sizes that mm -hmm. allow students access to the futures that they choose for themselves um, with the kind of professional attention and support that they require. Um, a step back from this precipitous uh, e-learning idea and, and a, a, a multi-party work group that will sit down, study, uh, find the research and find ways uh, uh, that would make this succeed before we, before we leap into it. Um, and we're looking at not only maintaining but enhancing the support staff um, in our schools. Our schools are very different places from 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, they're much more highly integrated. There are kids with, uh, with different kinds of needs in our schools than mm -hmm. we used to have in, a, in, a, uh, in an integrated school. And, uh, and we believe that we, uh, and it, the, the figures around the in, you know, increasing uh, incidence of violence point to the fact that some kids aren't getting the supports they need to succeed in school. So we don't just need the same number of support staff, we need more who can give those kids an equitable chance at success in their school years. Now you mentioned support staff, and although they're not uh, part of your organization, uh, CUPE, the Canadian Union of Public Employees, have support staff and administrative staff and uh, clerical and janitorial staff. They recently came to uh, an agreement with the government. How is that going to impact in terms of your negotiations? It's a really interesting question. I mean, on the one hand, there's some encouragement to be taken from um, the apparent uh, recognition on the government's part that these staff are critical to student success and so there was a recovery of lost or, or will be assuming that this uh, it's a tentative agreement if it's ratified mm -hmm. by the membership um, that there will be a recovery of those staff and those supports in boards where QP represents the staff um, uh, you know those supports will will be returned um, to students so so you know to that extent it's encouraging and on the other hand at our own bargaining table when we asked um, the Crown representatives, mm -hmm. do you have any new proposals since the reaching of that tentative agreement to bring forward to us on staffing? They said, no, this table sits in isolation from all other tables. Each table is its own isolated entity. How is that possible? Well, it's never been possible in the, in the history of education sector bargaining in Ontario. And on top of that, not 10 minutes after we were told that at the bargaining table, I got a phone call from a reporter who said, would you like to comment on what the Minister of Finance just said publicly, which is that we should all look to the QP deal for guidance on where, um, you know, what might be possible in terms of, of our negotiations. So when I talk about them contradicting themselves, I mean, there couldn't have been a starker example of them saying two different things at the same time. It just seems to me that there's even confusion on the government side as to which side is speaking for which. It seems like the left hand and the right hand aren't communicating to each other. There are uh, a lot of things going on um, with this government. I mean, there's obviously an ideology around, uh, around cuts uh, and so forth, but um, I think they've demonstrated over and over again that in large part they're driven by incompetence. It's hard to, they, they, they've hardly made a decision that they've been able to stick to when the unintended consequences have rolled out. So you saw what they did to the autism uh, program as, mm -hmm. as one example where they've had to somewhat re reverse course. 
as of yesterday, I mean, not related to education, but just a kind of demonstration, as of yesterday, um, they're no longer uploading the Toronto subway to, to right. uh, yeah. provincial control. They're, they're leaving, you know. Um, how is it that you can make that announcement, turn around and make the opposite announcement um, and maintain any credibility? And I guess the answer is you can't. can't. <laughs> yeah. So, so now if people watching or listening in want to learn more, I... I understand that you've set up a couple of different websites. So you have uh, one dealing specifically with the bargaining where people can get the information and download it and, and get the updates as things go along. That one is? Uh, bargainingforeducation.ca. Okay. And then you have another one that talks about the impact uh, based on the Conference Board of Canada's uh, report that you referenced earlier in the show and that one is better schools stronger economy and i would i strongly encourage people to have a look at that to understand the effects of investment in education okay we'll put up both of those urls so people can uh, download that or, or uh, reach out to that and in terms of uh, students if uh, parents or others are interested in learning more from the students perspective where can they get information Oh, absolutely. So our website is www.osta-aco.org and they can get a full glance at the Can you give us the actual letters so that people... Yeah, like www.osta-aeco.org um, and their parents and educators can get a read through our publications that outline the recommendations we have for our government on how to enhance the existing education system. And Jennifer, you mentioned uh, for parents, uh, there's uh, an organization that uh, uh, they can access uh, for more information. So uh, the Ontario Families for Public Education have a large Facebook page um, that they post uh, almost daily uh, or as things happen, um, resources for parents so that they can see the impacts of, of the cuts and how it's going to change their child's education. All right. Well, thank you all for a very illuminating discussion. I'm sure that there's going to be more down the road, so I will invite you back and hopefully we will have an update and uh, in a positive uh, aspect. And I'd like to thank you for tuning in and uh, listening on the podcast uh, to the point. My name is Marcel Weeder. Until next time, thank you.